Welcome to our panel discussion on the intersection between gender, political economy, and security. Uh, we are happy to have four fantastic panelists who I will introduce briefly here and a set of questions that we're interested in. Our format will be that we'll have the panelists discuss some of these questions and then uh, leave some time at the end for questions and answers and discussion with those of you who are attending as audience. So we appreciate having all of you here. Um, the Royal Holloway Gender Institute is co-hosting this with the Royal Holloway Center for International Security. Um, and we're thrilled to be in this partnership with the Royal Holloway Center for International Security um, as we present this panel. So I will introduce the panelists briefly and then uh, ask the first question so that we can get started in our conversation. We have here uh, Dr. Swati Parashar, who is Associate Professor at the School of Global Studies, the University of Gothenburg, which I totally mispronounced, but since my last name is Swedish and I mispronounced that too, I get a pass, maybe. Um, <laughs> her research and teaching interests are in critical security and war studies, feminist and post-colonial international relations, Women Militants and Combatants, Violence and Development in South Asia. Her recent co-edited book with Jane Parpart on silences has been making noise with cross-disciplinary audiences. Okay, maybe I just think I'm funnier than I am. Um, out of Outside of research interests and publications, Dr. Parashar writes uh, social and political commentaries on various local and international media outlets. She also runs a feminist blog, Kal Radi, which aims to rethink and reclaim silences, solidarity, difference, and diversity. We also have with us Dr. Marsha Henry, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Gender Studies at the London School of Economics. She was a founding member of the Center for Women, Peace and Security there and served as its Deputy Director between 2015 and 2018 and as Interim Director between 2018 and 2019. Her research interests include a focus on gender and development, gender and militarization and qualitative methodologies. These interests have concentrated on documenting social experiences of living and working in peacekeeping missions and peacekeepers from the global south. Her recent work addresses military masculinities and the challenges of conducting research on sexual violence in conflict. Uh, Dr. Daniela Lai, our third panelist, is a lecturer in international relations at Royal Holloway University of London, uh, where she also did her PhD several years ago. So before coming back to Royal Holloway, she held positions as lecturer at London South Bank University and a fellowship at the LSE Department of Methodology and at UCL as a teaching fellow. Dr. Lai's research interests lie in transition transitional justice and peace building, the politics and political economy of international interventions and post-war transitions. Her very recent book, uh, Socioeconomic Justice, International Intervention and Transition in Post-War Bosnia and Herzegovina, which considers the experiences of socioeconomic violence during war and how they subsequently allow strong but unheeded justice claims in its aftermath. Last but not least, we have uh, Professor Spike Peterson, who is Professor of International Relations in the School of Government and Public Policy at the University of Arizona. So note it's pretty early in the morning for Spike right now. Uh, so Professor Peterson is a highly decorated scholar, having been awarded the LGBTQA Scholar Award in 2018 and the Charles McCoy Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Political Science Association in 2016. Uh, Dr. Peterson has published more than 100 books and articles on a wide variety of subjects on gender, security, political economy, and theory. Um, and uh, she has so many awards to her name that it is difficult to list them. We are lucky to have all four of our panelists here. Um, and we're going to start a conversation between them and hopefully learn a lot about the intersections of gender, political economy, and security. So how this will work is I will kind of bring up one of the questions that we have, and then we'll allow the panelists to kind of volunteer in order to talk about them and uh, engage from there. So the first question that we have is, how would you describe the key concerns of feminist approaches to political economy 
and the key concerns of feminist approaches to security. Yes, Swati. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, first of all, this is going to be fun. I like the way it's uh, kicked off. Uh, very unusual. But thank you, Laura, for organizing this uh, very important panel. And I think it's so wonderful to be back with friends. For a while now, I've been attending, uh, you know, giving talks and panels and conversations I've had with people outside uh, IR and outside the friendly faces that uh, that uh, we are used to. I'm so happy to see Spike and you and Jillian after so long. I think I I mentioned that it's uh, really been, I think, uh, a decade since since I saw you. So really happy to be here. Um, this is a very important discussion to be had because of uh, obviously uh, the lessons that we have learned from the pandemic, right? That the intersections between security, gender, political economy actually holds the key to understanding governance. Uh, and also the kind of necropolitics, if I can use that term, that we have seen with this pandemic and, you know, the management of it. Uh, and also some of us who wish to see a different world, wish to, uh, you know, kind of uh, see a different uh, a, a different kinds of, uh, you know, things to unfold uh, with, uh, with our sense of hope. I think for all of us, I think this intersection is absolutely critical. Uh, and and some of some parts of the world, as uh, we have seen, has actually witnessed so much suffering in in this pandemic. I'm thinking immediately of uh, uh, my home country, India, where uh, I have not been able to visit for the last uh, one year or so. Uh, large scale internal reverse migration that occurred from urban to rural. I think the the uh, the the coverage worldwide, uh, you know, just watching the people and the hardship of people just walking miles and thousands of kilometers. I think some of those images are going to stay with us and haunt us for a while. Uh, and, and, and the kind of economic precarities, the insecurities that we have found uh, that uh, the in, intertwined, they are so intertwined and they have uh, in the most obvious way and how that has come through when we think about this pandemic management and governance. Coming to the main points that you make, uh, that the question that you ask us, Laura, to me, two things are critical. One, when I think of critical uh, political economy, to me, uh, it is tied to questions about global inequalities. And that's broadly defined right now. We can come back to it. But it was very, very evident in the last year that we, we really are looking at a world where uh, inequalities are rampant. It is not just between the South and the North. It is within global south states it's also within the north and what has unfolded has been absolutely uh, educative in that sense the other thing that i think is absolutely crit critical in in thinking about political economy is this larger disconnect between states and societies states and citizenry and um, and and i'm sure that there are different ways in which we can express this some of us would like to call it oh we have you know populist states right now uh, but uh, but i don't think that this connect is uh, more pronounced in the global south as used to be said i think we're watching it everywhere in the world that very masculine muscular states which want to be if i can say so want to be accessible to the public want to be anti-elitist want to make policies of the people but on the other hand they are very very exclusionary and far removed from the realities of ordinary people and i think this is the age of contradictions in some sense so if i had to just kind of pick up on two of the things i would say the inequalities and this this kind of dissonance this disconnect between state and citizens um and thinking about uh, uh, uh feminist uh, you know what what is of concern to us as feminists uh, in terms of security, uh, I have always studied uh, violence in uh, one form or the other, and I think it continues to uh, educate us. We continue to adapt ourselves to different kinds of violence. I think pandemic was one kind which unleashed, which had within it several other kinds of violence. But I think we have to really expand our notions of what we mean by violence. And I think we are too fixated with wars and conflicts, and we still use that language. Uh, later on, I Will come to talking a little bit about uh, the you know studying uh, food insecurity, hunger, and famines. But I do want to talk about how violence is absolutely central and expanding notions of it when we think about security, insecurity, and fem and and feminism. So let me stop here, and I'm sure that we can come back to it. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Uh, any panelists volunteering to follow on from that? 
Okay, uh, then I'm going to call on Marsha. What do you think, Marsha? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, how do you do that? That's really that's really unfair, Swati, considering Swati and I were having all these discussions uh, in WhatsApp over the course of the day. I think she just strategically outmaneuvered me here <laughs> by going first. How do I follow such a, a brilliant and energized start? I guess what what's really exciting about being on this panel is that I think some of the interdisciplinary nature of these discussions, which I think were foundational to feminist political economy and feminist approaches to security, at least 20 years ago when I started to um, be a, 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 guy, a, a little bit of an interloper in feminist IR, but there was there was a an openness and a richness within the feminist security studies and feminist political economy fields because they were already drawing on these interdisciplinary perspectives. And so for me, the key concerns of these feminist approaches to both political economy and to security have been to draw on a range of, you know, to be inspired by a range of conceptual frameworks from, you know, from a variety of disciplines and subfields. And I mean, one of the things that I think has been quite constant and I and I see a kind of return to it over and over again, or at least a kind of um, a renewed commitment is really about looking at structures and structural um, inequalities. So Swati was illustrating some of those inequalities through kind of, you know, some examples in particular. But, you know, for me, um, feminist approaches to political economy are about recentering a gender analysis into arenas like the world of work, um, issues issues of money, you know, and remuneration, um, and the structures of society. And so, for me, these these approaches, both the feminist approaches to polit political economy and the feminist approaches to security, you know, uh, cannot be divorced from um, analyses of structural forms of power. And so for me, those are the key concerns. They cannot do that. And so what Swati said about violence, what Spike has said many years ago and Gillian Young has said um, in, in scholarship, it, you know, it's we need to keep paying attention to power and, and not just, and this is not to dismiss discourse as some kind of um, you know, fad. I'm, I mean, I wouldn't want to minimize it, but to really pay attention to some of those structures and those systems of oppression that persist and um, reappear in new forms. So I think I'll leave it there and see what what um, what that might inspire in terms of conversation or perhaps um, uh, invite to correct. <laughs> I think Daniela just raised her pen. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you all. And also, I want to say that I'm really grateful to be on this panel with all of you and for your work and for being like for your work being such an inspiration for our research and not just just for me, but for uh, many other scholars. And I think I feel probably 95 percent privileged and 5 percent intimidated to be on this panel with you today. But um, but yeah, it's really, really amazing. Um, and with respect to the question, um, I think building on what on the things that both Swati and Marsha have been saying, uh, when thinking about feminist political economy, I had a few things in mind specifically. Um, for example, these questions around um, social reproduction and how important they have been for, for a feminist IP. Um, as all of these activities that enable production, that sustain, reproduce the workers and that are so central to the economy, but have always been kind of relegated to secondary position in mainstream literature as a, um, and I think that the pandemic, as we've been, we've mentioned, has been also a quite important reminder that these questions haven't really gone away, despite, you know, some of the progress that may have been made recently, but that this the traditional distribution of gender roles is still very much um, present. Um, and then the other thing I thought of was also the um, challenging of assumptions about how formal and informal economies are defined and separated, and also the attention and emphasis on the lived realities of people and importance of looking at them as a as a 
important units of analysis for studying global politics and international relations more broadly um, and kind of trying to decentralize what we mean by international, highlighting the importance of everyday practices. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to mention that I think probably refers to both security and political economy is that like when we talk about security and political economy, I was thinking we we do mean fields of studies as in what feminist security studies study and what feminist political economy um, focus on, but they also are fields of interventions. And then they also refer to uh, to this kind of uh, context where the policies then intervene and that these can be three different things. And very often there is this they are misaligned and especially when we look at academic debates and policies there sometimes can be this disconnect with lived experiences and that I see one of the contributions of feminist studies as trying to question exactly what we mean by security and what we mean by political economy or specific economic models and um, how we use these terms in ways that may not really neatly correspond then to to the terms that then people end up using to describe their experiences. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, uh, I think I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn the floor over to Spike. Okay, that's, um, that's what, this is marvelous. Thank you so much, Laura, and everyone who's here. And I'm sorry, I want to um, locate myself in a, in a few ways. And one of them is that I'm in the United States, that my feminism is very much shaped by, all of my scholarship is shaped by this uh, extraordinary context within which I spend most of my time. But that was, um, it was a delight to hear these different takes on this initial question. And I had, uh, made some notes about starting from a different perspective, in part to locate myself. Um, and I identify basically as a critical theorist without particular specification, although I'm generally understood to be a feminist theorist, I'm proud of that, but um, it's always been more complicated um, to me. Um, and so I come out of feminist activism and civil rights issues, and then I'm an ardent critic of positivism. And when I came into a PhD program in my, when I was 34, I, um, that's what I wanted to learn about, what was going on in the world in terms of inequalities and the critique of positivism was surfacing by feminists, I will say, earlier and I think more systematically and systemically than Foucault and the other boys who get cited all the time. So the feminism that I, that it's my feminism. There are so many, we know that, and it's important, I think, to clarify that. So here is mine, hey, that it has always been uh, more complex than just male and female understood as sex difference or body parts. The really fabulous um, and transformative insight from feminist theorizing from my perspective is the recognition that the entire system of gendering as in masculinity has more power, privilege, authority, credibility, generalizations than femininity, right? So that all that is associated with masculine is valorized, overvalorized that with femininity undervalued. And that means that everything about gender is about valorization, differential valorizations. So in terms of political economy, that's obviously obviously relevant because what is political economy fabulous Gloria Stein, I'm going to, you know, what is economics but a system of values? Yeah. So to me, political economy has always been gendered because of that valorization. Think of labor markets, um, who gets paid to do what. Okay? And then the security issue is just a variation of that, if you will, okay? that because that which is associated with femininity, not all women are only women, is devalorized in terms of objectification and in security situations, much more likelihood of harms and violence, symbolic, perhaps especially symbolic, and also um, material. Right? So that's what I think feminism brings to both of those, uh, and I hope clarifies what I think feminism is most fabulous about. Thank you. 
Thank you, Spike. Um, maybe we'll ask the next question and kind of allow for responses and conversation as we deal with the next question too. Um, so the, the next question was, why is it important to you to teach at the intersection of political economy and security and to do your research at that intersection too? Um, and if you want to provide particular examples, that would be great. Um, but that's something that maybe our students and some of our audience who doesn't work at the intersection of political economy and security can benefit from. Um, do I have any volunteers to start this one? Um, shall I do that? Sure. Yes, that's great. Uh, no, so I think the questions that you asked, Laura, I think both of them are, uh, in, they speak to each other. Why is it important and what examples can we think of from our own work? Um, and to me, working at the intersections of post-colonial uh, uh, post -colonial state, post-colonial lives, uh, post-colonial discourses and feminism, I think it comes uh, uh, in some sense not as a big revelation that you absolutely have to uh, study uh, the political economy and, and uh, the intersections of economy and security. Uh, but to me, the critical thing is that security is always to be destabilized. And I think in all my work, this... Uh, uh, this anxiety about security is is uh, constantly played in in anything that I write and uh, you know the way in which I have thought about the post colonial. I would say that the uh, the entry point that I saw for myself in security, as I said, was through uh, political violence. But I think uh, you know obviously I consider myself uh, you know a very a member of a very large community of feminist scholars who work on questions of violence. Uh, but I also uh, see that there are very particular ways in which we have defined violence, even within feminism. We, we, we have created uh, the field of feminist security studies. We define it in particular ways. We have focused on war, uh, war and wartime sexual violence and everyday life in war. But I do think that the questions remain about, uh, you know, the presence of violence as both normalized and exceptionalized. Uh, so in some sense, are we... Um, exceptionalizing the normal or are we normalizing the exceptional uh, and we have to keep asking these questions right your your point is why are we interested why do I do what I do and I think to continuously ask those questions about uh, the texture of violence the historical continuities right and that's where the post-colonial uh, political economy analysis comes through the location of violence it's it's also transformatory potential that we've talked about it's ethical and moral dilemmas. Uh, and most importantly, the body counts, right? And this is a discourse, um, this is a debate that uh, that I have uh, had with some uh, colleagues uh, within post-colonial, uh, you know, uh, setups where we've argued that perhaps have we paid too much attention to epistemic violence and discursive violence at the cost of actually doing the body counts now. Because when we think about these global inequalities, somewhere we are we are losing track of the actual people on whom violence occurs, the injuries uh, and the coloniality of it, right? So I think these questions about about violence are fundamentally about security and insecurity. So I want to uh, hold on to that. In terms of my own work, I think uh, when I started working on, uh, uh, you know, looking at women who had uh, access, women's access to violence, advocacy of violence in militant wars, uh, not just perpetrators of violence. I think they were much more than that. You know how they performed war labor, as I, uh, as I would argue. Uh, I think that in in that gendered space of war where women Women were performing war labor and which was not, uh, as we know, studied by feminists. I think it was very important for me to understand the household economies. And that's where I started paying more attention to my own sort of, uh, you know, uh, a, a little bit of, uh, if you like, uh, being uncomfortable with political economy as if that was a field that wasn't for me. So I gradually kind of uh, brought myself into that debate because I realized that I had to study how household economies were shaped, how gendered structures were affected, how hierarchies were set up, uh, and how the political economy of the household shapes war 
war related labor and gender roles. So I think I, I uh, started with that and particularly looking at women combatants, women uh, performing war labor. Increasingly, of course, I have now uh, expanded uh, and perhaps I hope uh, with, with, uh, with the larger community that will come through, thinking through violence as more than just acts of war and thinking about, for example, uh, uh, violence that is erased, violence that is slow and less spectacular. So I'm thinking of uh, uh, famine and hunger deaths, a project that I have been engaged in for the last couple of years. And it has been incredibly uh, rewarding in some sense to think about ways in which different societies have thought about reparative justice, have, have thought about restorative justice, have thought about hunger deaths. And that is something that is going to stay with us for a very long time. In fact, all statistics reveal that more people die now because of uh, lack of food and food insecurity than actually in wars. And of course, famines are part of war. So I think, uh, so in some sense, I, the more that I widen my scope of trying to understand different kinds of violence and injuries on bodies, uh, the more that I think political economy is absolutely critical to it. So let me stop here and come back to it later. Thanks. Maybe Spike and then you and then Marcia. I have um, some examples maybe perhaps. They're very much in line with what Swati has said and, and we all are in various ways writing about studying research. Okay? Um, but I found one of the times that my international political economy, my critique of capitalism and economic systems and understanding of uh, security issues was in regard to a period of time when I was very much into critiquing informalization primarily because informalization merges so many areas of crucial inquiry, the household, okay, the various forms of labor that are often feminized, exactly why they are considered less valuable, um, and inclusive of other hierarchies of difference. Okay? So who does most of the world's informal labor? Um, people who are otherwise vulnerable different types of communities, races, ethnicities, uh, age groups even, yeah. Okay, so, and um, so uh, I see that, uh, I think it's Daniela's piece that refers to um, some of this informal economy that Goodhand uh, and Pew did, I don't know if I'm remembering that, thank you. <laughs> um, and it seemed to me really a, a good example of how you, how important feminist critique is. So looking at informal wars, if you will, the unconventional warfare that uh, we focused more on a decade ago for various reasons, but um, did suggest how global financial systems have altered the operation of war and conflicts more generally. Uh, which is not often well integrated into either the security studies or certainly the political economy studies. So if we think about the kind of new wars that Mary Caldor had, I'm just, it's a generalization as far as I'm concerned, that shifts from territorial to political identity objective as a real um, distinction between earlier wars and some that continue. Okay? It's therefore about identity, crucially, okay? Um, and that the financing of it is decentralized and often criminal in a way that gets very interesting for IIPE and, and international political economy. And in terms of gender, if we think about three different economies in the broadest sense, coping, who, what is the economy, who are the primary actors in that economy, they all overlap, okay? and what are they doing, and what are the incentives to move toward a peaceful or at least the conclusion of the conflict resolution. Okay? So in combat, I mean, in um, coping economies, it's primarily the feminized persons who are doing social reproduction and they are literally coping. So the objective is, in a sense, primarily to survive, to get through this and keep what is considered the domains of the private, the household, the family, kin networks, community, um, together in the meantime. This can also involve black market activities, right? but there's less of the um, economic uh, featured in it, even though it's throughout it. And then a combat economy, which of course is the fighting, the struggling, and who is mostly doing that, 
shifting, but most of the time we're often male. So that's a very masculinized economy, if you will, but now includes both entrepreneurial activities as well as um, fighting or combat activities, right? Um, and the objective is military, but for some it also becomes complicatedly profit-seeking, right? As one way, another part of survival to bring the, the groups together. And then the third economy is the criminal economy, which um, is more systematically um, uh, integrated in these unconventional wars because it is both a, a source of supplying finance and making profit. Right? So there are external actors who are involved, right? those who are able to produce funding, often criminally, right? um, and the gendering of that economy is, is more uh, masculinist and who we think of as typically controlling more of the economic resources, but feminized in the uh, particular ways in which criminal resources are often accumulated. This also shapes what the long-term objectives are. So in the coping economy, we can presume, hard to test, that there is a desire for resolving the conflict in some fashion. And the combat economy depends on who you think will benefit and who will not for your personal investment and whether you want to move past this particular conflict. In the criminal economy, seeking profits doesn't mean you want the conflict to terminate at all. So different insights on the um, more traditional, conventional notion of warfare. Thank you. I didn't mean to go on so long. Uh, Daniela, you want to weigh in here? Yes. Sure. Um, so when I saw these questions about the intersection, like why it was important for me to be at this in, to teach and research at this intersection, I kind of thought that I never that I always found it easier to do research at intersection of various things because I never saw myself as fitting somewhere really neatly. Uh, and probably political economy and security was one of these. Um, so in mo a lot of my research so far has dealt with questions of justice or what happens after in the aftermath of widespread violence against civilians and the kind of processes that are set up to deal with it. But uh, I looked at these topics very much from the perspective of those uh, affected by the violence and the mismatch between their experiences and ideas about violence and how they theorize justice and the way that international organizations which implemented interventions there uh, then dealt with it and they, the way they thought about violence and justice. And so I encountered problems in doing this because which I, I think highlight the importance of these intersection of in political economy and security because the kind of violence um, that the international organizations mostly worried about was very much linked to this uh, understanding of uh, war time violence linked to physical integrity uh, uh, as the main concern uh, and, and as a result the, and the need to do justice was seen in um, after mass violence was seen you know, there was of course a lot of this moral rhetoric of doing what's right but also in terms of protecting the stability and contributing to ending conflict and um, this uh, international peace and security that was used as a justification for the setting up of some of these justice mechanisms like the International Criminal Tribunal in the former Yugoslavia um, and preventing future conflict. And so the justice that these mechanisms do then is also very narrow and limited in scope, uh, focused on violations of physical integrity defined in international humanitarian law. Um, but then when researching uh, how the, how people went through these experiences of violence during the war and what they thought justice meant, then I realized how like, it became really apparent how socioeconomic violence, what I called socioeconomic violence in my research was like really central and how these experiences of violence were always bound to be multidimensional. So different dimensions were connected with one another. Um, and so trying to make these connections between socioeconomic violence, between policies of, of what was called ethnic cleansing or uh, different types of uh, physical violence and gender based violence required me to look at um, political economy and security as two things that had to be really interconnected. And it was a necessary part of my work to bring these questions together. 
um, in a way that uh, very often I found made more sense to the people I I talked to in during the course of my research than the international organizations that were um, that I was also sometimes interviewing and who did not really see these you know the connection between these two things in the same way. Um, so that was like the the reason, I mean, the rationale for looking at this intersection based on my own research. Um, I have, I don't know, I thought of other examples, like one example I will mention now uh, before I'll shut up, um, that comes from my teaching actually. I assigned a Marshall's article on peace exploitation to my students last year. Um, and we were talking about the experiences of uh, peacekeepers and peacekeeping economies and and so they looked at this article uh, talk that uh, is a really nice article i really like using it for teaching looking at the um, um, uh, indian and uruguayan women who are part of um, peacekeeping contingents in the un and like what it means that if you're trying you are trying at the same time to redress these gender imbalances in peacekeeping forces but then at the same time the un has to rely so heavily on contingents provided by the global south and the kind of inequalities that are embedded in that and and for the students it was really a moment where they saw during that week how like this connection between security and political economy made sense because a lot of the IR modules they had studied up until then hadn't really helped that much in establishing that connection and it almost like something clicked in that in that week um which i thought was really was really quite telling so i think like i like now using peacekeeping to teach about this as an example i think that this transitions to marcia <laughs> how great daniela i feel that so often the um the articles we write just end up in a little mini archive somewhere and it's so nice and so exciting to hear about somebody actually using it and it uh, having some resonances. So thank you so much for, for um, working with it actually in such an interesting way. Well, I mean, actually, um, Daniela, I was hoping that you were gonna actually talk a little bit about your research in Bosnia because I was gonna just mention in a sense um, the one of the ways in which I think it's important to research and teach at the intersection of political economy and security is precisely because it draws attention to two things that I think other people have touched on, um, which is one is the need to sort of start at least some of our analyses from lived experience. And so if we start some of our analyses or start some of our discussions from lived experience, then we have to pay attention to geopolitics. And if I talk to any of the activists and feminist scholars work, you know, living and working in Bosnia, they will tell you they can't do anything without a political economy framework. You know, nothing, nothing that they think about. Um, you know, does not include the political economy of the pre-war period during war and now the very long um, post-war period. Um, so I think actually political economy also allows us to address perspectives and experiences from a variety of conflict and post-conflict and peace, peace um, contexts as well that perhaps we might not otherwise pay attention to if it wasn't if we weren't living in those particular contexts. So I think it stimulates a different um, set of questions and concerns. And so, yeah, and I think that in doing that, it perhaps also challenges secure, feminist security studies in particular to, you know, pay attention to lived experience. Of course, many people have done that in their analyses, but to remember, and, the, and then when you do that, you have to pay attention to questions of race, questions of ethnicity, questions of other axes, questions of class, actually, because as you said, Daniela, socioeconomic violence is about global class politics and, you know, and, and the war on the poor, really. So if you, if you don't pay attention, if you don't, if you aren't stimulated to ask those kinds of questions through a particular subfield or a particular discipline, I, I, I have a quite promising, um, 
um, opinion of political economy and perhaps a more skeptical one of feminist security studies in, in what I'm saying there. But I think political economy approaches provide a, um, um, some, some more question marks that we, you know, and curiosities that we need to keep, keep um, exploring. So I think I'll just leave it there. In, in, Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Maybe there's a good link here to the question of what some of the harms of ignoring the economics of security and or the security insecurity of economics are. So um, most traditional scholarship kind of goes one way or the other on the security political economy question. Um, and many, most of your research demonstrates the problems with that. So I was wondering if uh, each of you might talk about the potential harms of missing one part of this or another. Um, Marsha, you want to start? Yeah, I may as well, because I was thinking I could I could kind of link that to some of the, the work that I've been doing more recently um, on um, trying to understand gender-based violence in the post-conflict setting in Bosnia. And my colleagues um, at LSE and I, who were um, who wrote a recent article, trying to bring together, it's so, so complicated. That's the, that's the, that's the scholastic harm of using or of ignoring certain kinds of um, conceptual um, and theoretical traditions. It's just like, we tried to shove everything we could into that article. <laughs> and I mean, that's some of the limitations of that, but we were really trying to sort of say, look, if you take this political economy perspective, you take the feminist literature on that, you take literature on continuums of violence, and you put them all together, is there a way in which you can capture the post-conflict situation for vulnerable individuals? And I think if you don't try and do sometimes, I think if you don't try and do some ambitious work, you know, drawing on all these traditions, you you may end up, you know, um, you may end up giving a very selective perspective. And so, you know, that one of the challenges that we had in doing that research was drawing on, on such an, an amazing amount of work that has been done. So it's not that it hasn't been done. It's It's about trying to find it, <laughs> trying to recover it, and trying to incorporate it. And I guess one of the issues that came up was this real challenge between, you know, so we were talking about gender, you know, we were drawing on research on gender-based violence that had been conducted by one of our, one of the, my co-authors. And um, all of the terms that individuals were using in this research were terms that maybe in another context we would have really struggled with. So, they talked about sex trafficking. They talked about victims. They talked about, um, um, you know, stigma. Women in 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 Bosnia being stigmatized by divorce and so not being able to leave abusive and violent relationships. And you know, part of me was trying to consistently incorporate these individuals and their experiences into politically critical categories. So I wanted to, you know, name them as sex workers. And sometimes I wanted to name them as prostitutes. Sometimes I wanted to name them as victims. Sometimes I wanted to name them as survivors. So not only were we struggling with all these political economy traditions, but we were trying to do less harm in how we represented these individuals. So I don't know, that doesn't answer the question about you know, reducing harm, but it just tells you about some of the complexities about trying to draw on this, this scholarship, and then what kind of ethical obligations arise in doing that, because the, at the end of the day, you are representing individuals' lives, and they have a lot at stake in that. So maybe I'll just start with that. Uh, Spike seems like she wants to add on to the end of that. So maybe I'll let Spike go next. Uh, um, that go, just, um, it, thank you very much, Marsha. I really enjoyed these comments, uh, and it reminds me how uh, how much I engage in abstract theorization. Um, uh, um, um, and that made me forget what I was going to say. Oh, that 
I have actually done no uh, international security field work. I do very little field work, so it's really helpful for me to hear from people who do so and what the insights and knowledge production and uh, that that emerges from that that I'm recognizably out of touch with. Um, but what I was thinking about is the harms uh, is because I think without paying attention right, to structural inequalities in which feminist theorizing has the particular contribution of saying all structural hierarchies inequalities um, feature some version of celebrating things that are associated with masculinity over those with femininity, including aggression and assertion and independence and power and order and all that kind of thing. Right? Um, but the political economy part has to me always been as a criti critic of capitalism for a long time, um, that it is the system most fundamentally determining or shaping the distribution of resources, cultural material and all of the rest, eh, in which that shapes all of our lives so profoundly. Eh? And the, one of the ways, one of the very important ways it does is through its impacts on security and the kind of um, both as cause of resentment eh, for being insecure for the inequality subjected to, and also for gains in various ways of different orientation. So it, what feminists, I believe, add more than most of the other alternative critical traditions, I'm not uh, uh, excluding anti-race, post-colonial, post-structural, eh, is affect matters. Eh? And without paying attention, to why people are engaging in conflicts in these important on the ground insecurity issues um, has to, you have to grapple with how we are attached to identities and desires and goals and objectives and all the rest of this. Um, so we need to be able to see if we want to address insecurities and violence, okay? what are the motivations to affect the investments going on underpinning and spurring such actions okay? and and also what the processes are which was kind of why the the looking at the different economies who's doing what hey okay? how does this shape what we do okay? and then the financial features of that shape all of our lives especially since globalization perhaps you know depending on what you how you define terms but certainly since the globalization of finance um yeah so the harms are not knowing what the hell we're talking about okay I mean, it's one of my just biggest critiques of the discipline, the, you know, the mainstream discipline of international relations is how little it has informed a critique of power across the array and the complexity of power relations. And I think that intersectionality is still just disregarded in ways that, yes, you can debate intersectionality, I want to all that, okay? but fundamentally looking at how systems of power interact is a requisite for making sense out of the world we live in, as far as I'm concerned, and thus spoke with Spike. Thank you, Spike. Um, Daniela, you want to go next? Sure, I'll try. Um, so I think the very obvious thing for me to mention would be that it is actually really harmful to, so if we're ignoring the economics of security and securities of economics, it means that we are really, really reproducing this disconnect from lived realities on the ground. And uh, and I think that there have been, I, I was thinking specifically of um, the recent article that Maria Martin Dalmagro and Caitlin Ryan wrote. I think Maria is also in the audience, so I thought I should mention her. Um, and um, which was really important because I thought it highlighted these pitfalls of isolating security and political economy and highlighted this disconnect between what they called, I think, the materialities of women's lives and agendas of economic empowerment in um, that are embedded in, with, within women, peace and security initiatives. And I think that's just like one recent example of literature that tries to, again, reconnect security and political economy in a way that also moves the deba debate forward in theoretical terms. Um, and also, uh, I think one of the harms we want to probably avoid in this is 
this risk of um, that in if we tackle these dimensions of economics of security and security the dimension of political economy, ending up with a securitized version of political economy and a very instrumental view of economics where gender is seen as a, in a very instrumentalized way. Um, and that probably critical, this kind of critical scholarship that the people on this panel um, were speaking now do um, is try to avoid that because of this continuous questioning and trying to, as what he said earlier, destabilize the idea of security so that we avoid this risk of ending up with um, removing issues from public accountability because they are termed, they are labeled as the security issues and uh, and as a result then also end up seeing economic exclusion in instrumental terms when we talk about economic inclusion of what are routinely called marginalized groups on various grounds, including gender, but also race or sexuality or disability, uh, that these are always seen as useful insofar as they prevent uh, um, poor economic outcomes or a relapse into conflict or um, because they, they are needed because they support a certain kind of model of economic growth. And so I think this is one of the harms that we want to probably try to avoid with these more critical view of security and political economy. Um, and uh, I think I will stop here, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so um, I was saying that a lot has already been said, so I'll just keep this brief. I think a couple of quick points. One is that, uh, you know, the entire political economy of, uh, of the colonial encounter continues to shape global inequalities. I have uh, just, um, uh, you know, edited uh, with a colleague a third world quarterly special issue on uh, colonial legacies in Africa. And, uh, you know, almost all the papers touch upon how these inequalities continue to govern life. I mean, it's it's quite an eye opener to see uh, how much we uh, we are still uh, ignorant of what the ground situation is. So a little bit to focus on how coloniality still, uh, you know, is very much part of uh, the way the world is shaped, but also how struggles for sovereignty and uh, even struggles, uh, contestations over hegemony that we are uh, thinking of, not just in terms of state actors, but also non-state, you know, different social movements, different groups of people, all the various conflicts that we see around this. I mean, it is linked to, uh, again, uh, you know, these are conflicts over resources. These are conflicts over who gets, uh, who gets to make decisions on behalf of whom and also inequality. So I think there is a little bit about those struggles for sovereignty and hegemony that I'd like to point out. But um, amidst all this, I think the big harm that I see that actually we would do to ourselves is to not unpack the role of the state, right? If we were to ignore political economy, I think a big uh, chunk of that analysis helps us really unpack the state. And I think uh, we did this, as I said, this is the age of contradictions. The state wants to uh, disappear out of our lives. And at the same time, it is very much present and uh, pre present in a particular way. I think the whole distinction between global South and North states having very specific characteristics, I think we have dismantled that in the last few years. So I think uh, if we just try to capture uh, the state and an understanding of the state, I think security and political economy are very closely linked. And I think we tried to do that in that book, Revisiting Gendered States, in which uh, Spike very kindly wrote the preface, which followed from Spike's own book, I think the discussions, but that's an ongoing discussion. And I think more people need to take that on. Uh, some people call it the post globalized world order. I'm not sure I'm just throwing it out to uh, people to think through, uh, you know, but are, are we in this post globalized or deglobalized uh, world order where we are seeing this diminishing support of the state led uh, development approach, but yet the state is very much part of our lives. And I think this is where how the state is so, uh, you know, so much part of formal informal economies and how it, uh, you know, it's part of so many conflicts. How do we think about it? I think it's really critical. Um, for me, I think I want to emphasize here the harm is that if we don't see ourselves as feminists, as, as just ivory tower academics and allow 
me to say that when we are uh, so much connected with social movements or we are trying to connect with the policy world, we are trying to work with colleagues on the ground, uh, you know, we, we are doing much more than, uh, you know, producing articles which half the time don't even get read. We are trying to, uh, you know, work with people, build solidarities, work with different movements. And I think in that context, I, I don't think we can afford to ignore uh, this intersection that we are talking about today. But I want to stop at this very important point, which may come back uh, later uh, to haunt me. But I want to emphasize that there is, uh, you know, there there is also the political economy of feminist research, right? And there is harms done through uh, ignoring the economics of security research. And I think we don't often talk about how we as uh, academics, as scholars, uh, into the business of knowledge production, what that knowledge production economy can do uh, when we, uh, you know, hyper visibilize some topics or some issues or we don't. Uh, we have power. We make political decisions about what we research. And I think we can talk about this as well as part of this intersection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so being cognizant a little bit of time, I think that I'm going to go to the last question, um, which we had to ask, which is, uh, what does this approach that combines political economy and security tell us about the current global political landscape, uh, including but not limited to the pandemic? Um, so uh, our hope was that maybe you would just give us a couple of insights into that that we can use to transition into asking and getting questions from the audience. Uh, let's see, who hasn't gone first yet? Uh, Spike, you want to go first? Yes, and I will try to be brief. I think that uh, not so much the pandemic, although the pandemic is, is certainly a part of everything you now, um, but so differentially experienced globally. It's, um, that's a whole nother topic. Um, I think a lot about uh, what I call the global new right. This is this um, proliferation of extremist movements, etc. that um, especially here, and who I am, I feel very threatened. I feel real um, anxiety about how deeply entrenched much of this is. And I don't think that we can understand that aspect of today's politics without paying serious attention to racism and heterosexism, which are driving forces both in terms of the impetus um, for emotional investments in some of these extremist moves, the willingness to be the vulnerability to um, seeing them as making sense a, and a return to traditional values, which from a feminist perspective mean uh, traditional notions of femalehood, family life, reproduction, and household um, reproductive processes. So I think it's very relevant in, in that context, especially. Thanks. Uh, anybody interested in going next? All right, I think I'll just call on Daniela then. Sure. Um, I don't know, thinking about the pandemic, um, what I thought was that at the beginning of the pandemic last year, there was this, um, for a while, a tendency to describe the coronavirus as a, something that was going to make us all vulnerable and that we were all in this together and that this virus didn't discriminate. And then it became very clear very quickly how this was, of course, not the case, uh, that COVID-19 was not going to um, you know, remove these inequalities in affecting everyone, but was actually going to exacerbate them. Um, and I think that this kind of approach that combines security and political economy was important to see through these really bad takes on the pandemic that we had at the start and see how like, people in certain professions, for example, um, where you had a majority of people in from poorer backgrounds or um, uh, minority backgrounds, a certain um, or women, and where people um, were where these categories were overrepresented, ended up having a higher incidence of 
of COVID-19 or the impact that this had on uh, people vulnerable to domestic violence and so on. And this, all of these things kind of made it really clear that we needed a different lens to understand the impact of the pandemic and that these kind of feminist approaches to security and political economy can make us more aware of the politics that also underpin some of the decisions being made around how to deal with COVID-19 and thinking about you know, do we have to protect uh, health or do we have to save the economy but then whose jobs are we actually trying to save here and um what kind of trade-offs are be were being are we being presented with when you know between protecting people from covid and protecting some fundamental rights and freedoms and so on and and i think that yeah i think this kind of critical view helped us helps us see through some of these trade-offs and see exactly how do we prioritize like what kind of political choices are made in prioritizing certain policies and certain social groups over others um, and uh, some people's and some groups welfare or protection or well-being is always you know a, a secondary thought or certainly not not a priority or something that we'll have to deal with later on somehow um yeah that's it for me uh swati yeah thanks um a lot has been said again, but uh, again, to uh, flag off a, f a quick point about uh, something that I talked about, the disconnect between state and citizens. And I know the popular world word is to say uh, we are living in, our in the times of populism. We have populist governments. We have populist parties. Uh, but to me, I think populism is also a word that uh, is, is slowly losing political purchase. I don't think we have uh, quite nailed it down. I know it's uh, it's become uh, very much part of the political uh, vocabulary these days. But I'd like to stay away from that and argue that we are watching a particular kind of state emerge in different parts of the world. Uh, even the populism uh, that we talk Talk about has different origins, has different context, and I think we have to unpack a lot of that. But I think there is this interesting moment to watch this disconnect, which we, which we can uh, perhaps arrest and perhaps address through uh, the work that we do, which is this disconnect between, as I keep saying, that uh, on the one hand, the state wanting to be part of our lives and yet ceding responsibility and leaving, uh, you know, who has access to citizenship, who is a citizen. I think these are debates that we've had throughout the pandemic, right? Who deserves a vaccine? Who is to be taken to the hospital? Who is to be left out? Who is the disease carrier? Who, uh, who is, the, which bodies are bearers, carriers of the disease itself and which bodies need to be protected? So I think those kinds of things can be unpacked through the work that we do. But also how I think it, it is an opportunity for us, uh, this uh, feminist approach to uh, political economy and security is an, is, is an opportunity for us also to have some stake in uh, in in, pol in the policy world as well. I know that most of us are, uh, you know, happy saying that, you know, we, we do our work and all. But I think feminist work is uh, very influential. It's very much part of uh, policy circles. Now we have seen globally the impact that uh, feminist work is making but again my question is we have to then think about how how our own feminist politics right uh, you know what what i call the political economy of research you know how we want to do good right we want to influence policy we want to uh, change the the ground realities and uh, we want to create a better world i mean we all want to do that but we end up creating producing precarities with what we do through our erasures through our silences through our through even what uh, our utterances uh, through what we visualize, through what we write about. So I think it's a great moment uh, for self-reflection for all of us as we think about, uh, you know, the future of where where feminist uh, analysis and feminist scholarship will go. Thanks. Thanks. Marsha? Great. I'll try and keep it brief so that we can um, hear from the audience. And I think on that note, um, Swati, I just maybe want to just invoke the um, the institution of the neoliberal university um, and how they have recruited um, so many students from all backgrounds all over the world um, from all over the world into programs during a pandemic 
they have, you know, at, at, at the same time that so many um, early career researchers and um, postdocs and temporary lecturers and so on have been put in more precarious positions, including to do with visas, to do with how they're going to eat and live. Um, and, and so I think that, um, you know, I think what has happened in the pandemic to date is a complete underestimation or a complete um, negligence of the gender division of labor in universities, um, if I can say that. Um, so, you know, just a very good example is, you know, that very recently, you know, in November at my university, they, you know, took, there was a big vote about whether we should continue in-person teaching. And I can tell you that the male-dominated departments <laughs> voted that we should continue to um, um, do in-person teaching and um, you know and we were in shock that this was this was occurring you know so I think you know and I hope I hope students who I know there's lots of students from my class from my classes and from my department here today participating and you know I think I, I hope that they're able to do a political economy analysis of, of of some of their professors but also of the institutions of learning you know in terms of how they have both tried to address some of the issues um, that are raised by the new economic situations that are arising but you know the ways in which they have also contributed to increasing inequalities both inside the institution and outside the institution and just you know you know when I hear stories of students that don't have and um, you know that don't have enough to eat and that local communities and local groups are providing food for postgraduate students international postgraduate students I really I think that that is a literally a crying shame and um, if a global if, if a political economy analysis can help us to address some of those um, inequalities. I, I hope it, you know, I hope it will continue to. Thank you. Well, thank you and thank all of our panelists for addressing these questions. Um, now I want to give members of the audience an opportunity to ask questions uh, if they would like to. Please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Um, and then we can kind of cycle through some of the questions that the audience might have. Um, okay, so I have, we'll try and collect one or two, a couple of questions. Um, and I have one from Juliana first. Hi, it's, uh, it's not so much a question, but a really, uh, a comment. I was really struck by the fact that when you first sort of all started to speak, uh, you were not just introducing yourselves, but you were very aware of your own situatedness. You know, you were kind of situating yourselves as as women, as scholars. And I just thought, most of my male colleagues wouldn't do that. Uh, and of course, it's linked to all the things that you were saying, that, you know, that sense of your feminism impacting your scholarship and your scholarship impacting your, uh, you know, our feminism. It, it's really interesting. But also maybe there is a sense in which we, we kind of sort of feel the need to kind of situate ourselves, but perhaps because we are... You know, given all the context of inequalities that you've been talking about and, and kind of gender, how actually that situating yourself is is a moment to kind of sort of take stock of who you are, where you are and what's happening around you. So I thought it was really quite striking. So sorry, it's not really a, a question, but I, I was very struck by that. Thank you, Juliana. Um, I got a back channel question that I'll ask so that we can have a couple of questions floating around, which was, um, have you found ways that are more or less useful to talk to students about how it's necessary to interact political economy and security when we're talking about some of these issues? Um, was the question I got by back channel. So maybe Juliana's comment and this question, and that can be our first round of things to talk about among the panelists. Um, so anybody want to go first? Yeah, I think I'm this uh, front bencher in the classroom, right? It's this, this annoying person who has something to say. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Juliana. I just want to uh, point out that uh, 
I think it's it, it's become part of our training, but it's also if you look at the number of um, public spaces and scholarly spaces and policy discussions occupied by men, it's so annoying. I mean, it's this might be uh, or or uh, you know the safety of panels that we you and I attend is is just amazing because when I look at my social media feeds or events that are organized, I mean there there is just it's almost like a tsunami of men manals. And it really annoys me as if they are the ones making important discussions about um, uh, there's there's a conference going on in India right now on internal migration, a, a newspaper, uh, they, the media houses also organize these events and they're all men. I mean, on such an important topic, it's just incredible that you see so many uh, men around. And I think it has become part of our training. And I think it also allows us to perhaps reflect on where we want to go with our work. And I think some of the, uh, and offset some of the critique that we receive also as feminists. And uh, we engage in that self-critique, but we are also always watching out, you know, even within our own community, I think we we are quite aware that we're not doing everything right. And I think this helps us uh, keep on track and, and on toes, I would say. Uh, in terms of students, uh, they, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer it, but I would just say that I find students so incredibly uh, informed and the classroom is so global that I would uh, not say that. Uh, I, I think they often come up with their own ideas of how they want to talk about it. And you you just can't. I mean, it's no longer the classroom that was 10 years ago. You know, if you just look at the mobility of students, mobility of ideas, uh, the kinds of, uh, you know, things they talk about. I think I'm more guided by what they and how they want to study, but perhaps others have better ideas. Thanks. Any volunteers to go next? Uh, all right, then since everybody's smiling slyly, I'll ask Spike if she has anything to say. I think for me, I don't actually, I don't have any graduate students anymore. And I don't teach political economy. Um, my, the, my unit is so disinterested in pretty much everything I do that uh, it, it forecloses many options. What I teach are undergrad classes in gender and politics, which I teach as a survey intro to gender studies, um, and feminist and uh, international relations and political theories. Um, I find my students aren't so well informed. I mean, some of them, some percentage of them are fabulous and uh, and others struggle um, with the prior education that they have received, which um, larger topic, right? I want to just very quickly make a point I think is really crucial to me and, and informs the larger discussion and is a pitch for the relentless critique of capitalism is as long as global financialization right, is the basis structure of the current global economy, global everything in terms of how it controls the value of money, right, then the state is corporatized, the state is acting like a competitive firm, right? and so are universities, and so are all of us in a new, you know, in a way that um, as participants in this system, we cannot not participate, we can only shape how we participate, right? but realizing how we're coerced into this, structurally coerced into this through the not just neoliberalism, but the global finances, which loses the state control over finances and monetary policy in a way that previously they had more control. Thank you very much. I think it's been wonderful, and I don't think I'll, I'll be quiet now. Marsha or Daniela, do you have something to say? Marsha does not have no. anything to say. OK, Daniela, no, I think do you? it's been said so well. <laughs> Daniela, do you have something to add or should we go to another round of questions? Um, I think a lot of smart things have been said in this question. I don't know if I can add anything original. All right, um, then we can go to another round of questions. So same thing, if you'd like to ask one, raise your hand um, and then I can also collect them on the back channel. Uh, so we have a hand raised by Emily Clifford. Hi. Hi, I don't know. Can you see me? 
Is that okay? Hi. Thank you so much for the talk. It was amazing. A wonderful way to start um, start the weekend, I think. It's enthusing. But um, I just wondered whether we could talk more about how this intersection between political economy and security can like be used to understand and resist violence. So I'm thinking mostly both in practices and the normalization of violence, but I'm trying to at the moment work out how this resistance could be theorized a bit better. I'm going to leave it there, but thank you. Uh, thank you. And I got one more back channel question that I can add to that for bringing around our conversations. And that was, uh, is there a political economy and security dimension to contemporary protest politics? Um, and if so, kind of how can we engage? So that seemed like it kind of had a little bit of a difference from Emily's question, but also related to it. So it seems great to talk about both of them uh, at the same time. So um, anybody interested in volunteering to go first? I mean, just really briefly, maybe um, to address this last point. I think there definitely is a security and political economy angle to contemporary protests. Um, I, I guess it's not very original what I'm about to say, but if you look at um, the Black Lives Matter protests in, in the US and also in the UK, I think you can clearly, quite clearly um, disentangle the two and see how they're related if we consider that a lot of them have to do with things like police violence, but at the same time are rooted in structural inequalities that go back to systems of disenfranchisement and exclusion and that have very clear economic roots and dynamics as well. And I don't think you can really separate these protest movements, for example, from long-standing uh, claims to reparations that have been made and uh, discussed for a, for a while and then you know, maybe they were a bit more prominent at some point in the 1990s, 2000s, and then we stopped talking. People stopped talking about it, or at least it became less prominent in public discourse. But I think the protests have really brought it back up on the agenda. Um, so, so that was kind of a very um, maybe not very original but straightforward answer to that last question. Okay, uh, thanks. Anybody else on resistance to violence and or protest politics? Uh, I, I just, I think probably for me the most important thing in regard to resistance these days is really recognizing the intersection of power structures and not just focusing on one. Sometimes that's a really strategic need, I get that, eh? but in our understanding of what is going on here, Okay. We have to think more complexly than the, the easier and um, desired answers um, permit. Thanks, Wadi. Yeah, I just want to add to what Spike said, and I uh, completely agree with you, Spike. I, I think we have to unpack resistance as well. I don't think we can use it the way we do. And I speak with... Uh, with uh, with with some kind of disappointment, I guess, when I see a lot of discussions on resistance or resistance theories, which largely have ignored uh, the kinds of struggles that uh, feminists have put up, or you know, Black Lives Matter, or what the entire post-colonial decolonial project has been. I find uh, you know current theories of resistance or discussions of resistance completely uh, you know stripped of these kinds of very important uh, you know projects that that. Uh, people have undertaken. And in that context, I want to emphasize that for me, the important learnings now are actually turning to the past. And I think the, and that's a project that we have given up on, like we're not so invested, but it's not history. It's just, you know, archives, people, projects, you know, movements that we have just uh, you know, left behind. And we are all so much in the now, in the contemporary, that I think we need to step back a little bit and get some perspective of what's happened in the past. And I think I find amazing revelations through that. But very quickly, I agree with Daniela on the point of 
protest politics. I mean, uh, my home country has protests uh, every day. I mean, we are we are we have the farmers' protest right now, and we've had uh, protests against citizenship acts. And I'm sure you read about it. A lot of coverage in the press, in the international press, not always very accurate and very uh, sympathetic or even uh, you know knowledgeable, but still it is there for us to know. Social media is full of it. There's been a number of protests on violence against women for uh, a very long time in different. Um, aspects and i think of course the link is there uh, but i do think that protest politics is uh, is uh, sometimes loses its meaning because of the kinds of conversations that we don't end up having and 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 lack of investment in building those solidarities you know movements take long time to to i mean feminist movement in india for example has taken a very long time to you know bring up issues and work slowly at the grassroots you can't just you know we we had the anti corruption movement in in 2010 11 and everybody was out on the streets hundreds and thousands of people but we didn't go anywhere with it so i'm just saying that the protest politics itself is very interesting to watch there's a lot of performance within that as well i would say yeah Maybe I can just add something. Thanks, Emily, for um, asking that question about resistance, because I think resistance is a, a little bit like the um, term political economy, which really just asks us to do what Spike was talking about, which is to consistently and continuously critique and be paying attention to the system of capitalism. So the, I think the term resistance itself requires us to to think to some degree in Marxist terms or to think in some way about how the economy is working and what it's doing. And I guess, you know, um, Daniela mentioned w one of my articles, but actually in, in thinking about how I ended that article um, or how I end um, an, another article that I wrote on peacekeeping was to sort of say that actually when we think about the political economy of peacekeeping or humanitarian spaces more broadly, um, or, or spaces that are insecure, we tend to kind of draw on a lot of these theories, um, which a, a lot of theories which um, help us understand the nature of security, for example, or the nature of the economy in a, you know, in a post-conflict environment. And yet somehow we can do we can do those analyses without actually centering or paying attention to those who are the beneficiaries of these or who are the hosts or who are the most vulnerable. And so, you know, I mean, part of what I've been doing more recently is to kind of is to kind of look back on what happened to the use of those critical theories, um, you know, along the way when we are thinking about these humanitarian spaces or these peacekeeping spaces, where are the peace kept, you know, and, and all of the resistance that they're engaged in, um, in, in terms of fighting back against these neoliberal policies, fighting back against this, not to romanticize this, uh, you know, because there's lots of co-optation and, and, and complicity involved in these, inter, in these go global governance institutions. But certainly I think, Resistance, if I if I um, want to think about it in you know in terms of feminist curiosity, resistance, I think, um, engenders a kind of uh, continued questioning and curiosity, and it keeps some of that you know that those questions about capitalism at the uh, you know at the forefront of our minds. Thank you, Marsha, and thanks to all of our panelists and all of our audience members that made this such a lively conversation. I think that uh, rather than try and collect another round of questioning and answer it in a minute and a half, uh, we will call an end to our formal session. Uh, but thanks again to our panelists, to our audience, to the Center for International Security. We've been thrilled to host this conversation and it's great to have a bunch of people from the Royal Holloway community and from around the world attending, listening to and being a part of these conversations. So thank everybody very much.